L- little throw it right back at you, Pat. We're back. Episode two, season three of Talking Thrones, entitled Dark Wings, Dark Words. Pat, would you say that there are some dark words uh, that, that are traversed on some dark wings this episode? Listen, I think the uh, Talking TV family is going to agree with me that there's some dark times ahead for multiple characters, for multiple including characters. Theon. But mostly Theon. But mostly Theon. <laughs> All of that and more. Stay tuned. Well, we just straight up butchered that joke. What's going on, people? Welcome back to yet another episode of Talking Thrones. <laughs> uh, speaking of getting butchered, uh, Theon yeah, starts right. with a, a oh, little man. nail under the th- uh, a little the nail under the thumb, thumb nail. the little little right? thing twisted into the toe. Like Pat, you you gotta break this down for me before we get this started. Like you have this odd fascination with some of the most like either the most twisted characters or the characters that have the most harm under them. Like it was Joffrey at the beginning of the season two. Now it's Theon. Like oh man, I, I don't even want to hey. think about what's gonna happen when we get to Ramsay and like his more of his involvement in this show. Listen, Dom, I, I just, you know, don't really want to watch Theon go through this again. I, I've seen it way too many times. You know, <laughs> once was enough. It? It, it's only like two. Only know? two. So, so it's like. And that was enough. Listen, the first time Theon went through his uh, trials and tribulations, it was enough for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I had to go through it a second time already, and, and we're about to go through it a third. A third, man. Here, yeah. Here's where it starts, and it's like, you know, just jam that metal right under his uh, fingernail, uh, you know, course through to the foot. Oh, so like, point, of re- point of reference for the future, man. Pat does not do well with torture sequences. I guess I should have taken that into consideration before I asked him to be my co-host on this show, a show that where we talk about a show in which there are lengthy sequences of torture, rape, mutilation, just some of the worst things that can be done to the human body. Probably should have kept that in mind as far yeah, as Yeah, the, the middle age is probably not for me probably you know, not the listen, best time here to just be alive in general I, I like slasher flicks like you know friday the 13th yeah right Elm street all that's that type cool, of stuff but but, that, but that's a suspension of disbelief right this is supposed to be real like a guy who's you know uh tied up to this sort of x and you know basically little little by little parts are just like shaved off of him ah uh, but Pat, uh, remember, it's, it's terrible remember, it's not an X. It's a flayed man. And, and that, like I said, it's, it's subtle little clues. Like, I like how they build that up as far as that goes. Like, where, again, even though for the majority of the season, at least up until a certain point, you don't know where Theon is or who's torturing him, it becomes pretty in the very, like, the little clues here and there as to, like, you know, where he's being kept and everything. But people, we're here to talk about season two. Sorry, episode two of season three entitled Dark Wings, Dark Words. This is the last for a couple people involved in the creative side of the show. This is the last episode directed by Daniel Minahan, who directed episodes six through eight of season one. He directed the previous episode as well as this episode, as well as this being the last episode written by Vanessa Taylor, um, who wrote famously episodes four and six of the last season. And we kick this episode off, right? This it, this is weird because this is kind of like the, the the I saw this with a couple of season starters where because there was so much freaking storylines and so many places and characters to hit that they ended up just kind of splitting them off and dividing them up across two episodes where Last episode, right, we got a brief glimpse of Harren Hall and everything that was going on with Rob, who obviously has an, a pretty extensive part this season. But we, it was mostly Dragonstone with Davos, King's Landing with, uh, you know, catching up with everything in King's Landing and then catching up with Daenerys, obviously. This episode, we get caught up with Arya. We get caught up with Jamie and Brienne, who we did not see last episode. We spend more time with Rob. We get caught up with Bran. We get caught up with Theon. A lot of things that are going on, of course, in the world of Westeros. And the other thing, too, that this episode establishes, I find, is that It kind of moves the primary bulk of the action away from King's Landing. Like the unique thing about season three, right? King's Landing is always the centerpiece of the action. It is always the centerpiece of the story. But this is the first season to me where the primary bulk of the action takes place outside of King's Landing. You know, like obviously with Theon's torture sequence, Bran's journey north, all the crazy stuff going on north of the wall. You know, Daenerys finally having a substantial um, arc. Rob and obviously his entire arc that we know is going towards the Red Wedding. I do find that like all the stuff that's happening as far as like kind of the political games that are being played between the Lannisters and the Tyrells and King's Landing. It's not 
Actually, you know what? I'm going to say it. It's probably the least eventful of the King's Landing storyline. It doesn't make it any less substantive or any less important. But I don't know. Like, what kind of what's your take on that, Pat? You know, I, I think, you know, within this episode, we get the introduction of, you know, Lady Tyrell. Right. And, um, you know, essentially it's going to be a slow burn because they just entered an alliance and they sort of have to make it work. Right. They're fighting a war against, you know, the Starks in the north. And, you know, it's it's like King's Landing is and definitely status. Don't going, forget status. Status is still yeah, like this. Exactly. And, and, and I think it's one of those things where uh, it's going to be a slow burn because they they need each other at this point in time. And therefore, it's like they're kind of sessing each other out. I, I think the main thing is uh, when they invite Sansa to uh, eat those lemon tarts. Yes, indeed. Uh, bas- and basically. those lemon tarts, like I said. And, and if there's one that the Queen of Thorns gets, she always gets her way. She does not care for rules, regulations, stipulations. Yeah, anything uh, like that. And, and apparently you can't eat lemon tarts with cheese. You know, no, I don't know what apparently the hell they, they don't go, they don't go well together. Apparently yeah. they don't go well together. You know, okay, but, like, but the main thing is like they're trying to interrogate Sansa, you know, friendly in trying to make her feel comfortable. But they're trying to get information about, you know, their enemies who are the Lannisters. Absolutely. Indeed. So let's get into it. Like I said, even though there's not even like I said, this episode is kind of like the second part of the first part. So now we're catching up on all the storylines and we kind of and all the characters that we didn't get a chance to see last episode. Let's get into it. So we open up, right? So we got, so this is another, this is another rarity as far as episodes go, where we've got multiple storylines with different characters happening in, in the same lo- share, share location. You know, that, that really, I would say that really wasn't the case as far as things go for the, for, for the first two seasons, because the first season, everything was so super streamlined and like just kind of three locations, really King's landing North of the wall and, um, and, and across the ROC. And then we occasionally checked into Winterfell last season, even though we, had like a lot of stuff happening it was all like pretty stranded in their different isolated locations but this season is oh really we have like it's it's multiple it's different things with different characters happening but within the same region so we check in with the north the opening scene, we'd start with Bran. Oh, we're back with Bran, you know, because once again, so much is happening. Like, at the very least, say what you will about season two, Bran, but at the very least, like, Bran kind of being held captive in his own home as far as Winterfell with everything that was going on in the Iron Board. Like, you know, he was in a little bit of peril, you know? There, there was, like, a decent yeah. amount of stuff going on there. The, the thing about Bran is he starts off dream hunt, hunting, yes. right? So he's oh, he's, he's looking for the dreams. raven, and, the dreams and he, back. He, he's got the arrows, and yeah, at the very he's least, basically... His dreams were somewhat useful and prophetic. Yeah, it, well, uh, yeah, but it, like also <laughs> in his dreams, <laughs> his his brothers are mocking him. It's yeah. like, oh, you can't shoot an arrow. Ha yeah. ha ha. I mean, look, you know. I, I- give you that like that scene at the very least it's supposed to be nostalgic it's supposed to be like oh okay like he's remembering the better times you know the the, the more like quieter times you know then he's being nostalgic is what that is like he hears the voiceover of his dad like it's a recreation of the scene from the first episode obviously where his brothers were jostling him and he's trying to remember like a time where like they weren't in danger and they weren't on the run and everything's so, like i'll give him that scene but then of course he sees you know, the the one, the only uh, Jojen Reed portrayed by Thomas Brody Sangster, Emmy nominee Thomas Brody Sangster. He's come a long way from uh, what's it called. Uh, he's come a long way from love, actually, that kid. But, uh, but real quick. Yeah, Pat, it, well, his new mate shows up and uh, basically tells him, oh, you can't kill the Raven because that's you. Because that's and, you. Yeah. And just Mike drops his mind. Right. Pretty you much. Know? So pretty um, much. Yeah. It, it, it's very interesting because, again, like the, the Reed, the Reed characters all say were. The, the, you know, this is where we're introduced to the Reed characters. Where we were introduced to them a little bit earlier in the books. They were introduced last season. They ended up coming to Winterfell before the whole Greyjoy invasion. They actually helped take part in freeing Bran and uh, helping him escape from Winterfell uh, in the books. But this is the first we're introduced, obviously, to Jojen and Mira Reed, who are obviously the, the whole thing about these two characters is that they're the children of one of Ned's bannermen from back in the war, Howland Reed, who famously fought with him. Um, what's it called? And, and famously journeyed south with him in order to free his sister from the Tower of Joy and was the only surviving member. And so they, they, they got a little bit of lineage and they've got a little bit of kinship there as far as that goes and like martin was definitely very specific as far as like why he gave jojen green seer abilities similar to brands but i i think that again it's it's kind of a little bit exposited here obviously obviously you know Bran wakes up from the dream. He tells Osha. Osha is kind of past the whole dream. Like Osha's kind of with the rest of us as far as that goes. And they're like, I'm sorry, who gives a fuck about your three-eyed raven dreams? We kind of got, you know, more important stuff to worry about. Like, you know, try, like staying alive and, and uh, avoiding like all the massive amounts of people that want to kill you, both in the north and not in the north. And of course, as, as they're continuing to walk, they eventually run into the reeds in person. Like, I don't know, like how, how did they found them? Like, was it just uh Jojen's like green seer abilities? Like, like, like what like what's your mindset there? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. There had to be the the mind tracking, right? Because we see um, what you call the gentleman beyond the wall, the oh, one that's yeah. uh, in, yeah, yeah. in the wildling army who's sort of uh, taking control of birds. Uh, he appears in this episode as well, and uh, I, th- I think that's what it has to do. Is like they're using their abilities to locate Brandon Stark, and the fact is, Reed uh, understands the abilities a lot more than Brand does. Yes, indeed, and th- it, that's what makes it believable. Yeah, I find that interesting that like the reeds and kind of the role that they preserve, right? Jojen, the whole thing that he says is like, okay, I, you know, the reason why I, I can kind of answer all these questions that you have is because I've had these same abilities. But the difference being, obviously, Jojen is a little bit older than Bran, so he's had a little bit more time, obviously, to, to you know, develop them and hone them and uh, what's it called, and really begin to understand them. But the whole thing about it is that he also can see the future and he understands, obviously, that Bran, again, like, and, you know, it's funny. I know that everyone kind of like, um, I, I know that everyone gives Bran shit. It's like, oh, because Bran, as the Three-Eyed Raven, kind of oversaw and, like, you know, moved all the pieces, like the chess pieces, in order to make himself king. But I, I'm going to add a little bit something extra to that theory there. I'm going to go one step further and be like, okay, maybe it was Jojen that pushed everything into place because Jojen is the one who saw the future. He saw Bran becoming the Three-Eyed Raven. He foresaw his own death and everything, and he foresaw that Bran would become king. So was Jojen the one that was pushing all the chess pieces around on the board rather than it being brand seeing everything, you know, from the future and creating like another one of those famous time, you know, time loops that we love so much that yeah. happens all well, the time well, in these fantasy you, stories. You know what, Dom? Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, this was a cool story plot line that, uh, that just show, got dropped. Yeah. Like the show, so ne- the show n- never explores it and never will. And unfortunately it leads us up. It, it basically keeps, um, leading us on like we get the yeah. fact that he goes into the past and he basically calls out to his father and his father sort of turns around like what the hell is going on um you know basically we see bran impacting the past and we get the sense that there is this sort of like sci-fi fantasy um you know yep. ability that bran has to change that things timey, wimey, um, time loop thing i don't remember what the exact phrase from doctor who is but something along those yeah, lines yeah exactly and, and basically all we get is uh him sitting in a wheelchair uh yep. You know, waiting Fly, at the tree, yeah, waiting at the um, tree, putting his you know, mind into other animals, yeah, flying around that, like a bird. Well, I'm talking about the uh, the long night where he's just like twi- <laughs> yeah. twiddling his thumbs and yep. waiting for the Night King to stare him down oh, before uh, you know Arya comes in with the Deus Ex Machina. You know, like I can't what, wait till we what, get to the long night and just could, and just roast the shit out of that episode. You know, uh, this is one of the things that's really frustrating is we're right at the beginning. And the stuff with the brand is cool because it's, we're being introduced into this magic and slowly, you know, the reads obviously are a little more acclimated than us, the audience. And as things go on, we understand more and more about what brand's going through. Um, but to, you know, this is our second watch, you know, I, I actually, it's my third watch through the series. And the fact of the matter is we know where it ends. Right. And I it, said it's 2020. Yeah, they basically just sort of drop this storyline and segue into like, all right, we just need to wrap up the series. Yep. So it's it's one of those things where, you know, we can overthink uh, what we know about the uh, Three-Eyed Raven. It's, you know, there's some sort of magical abilities, but we don't really get to see the full extent. I feel like they set up a lot more than they show in this series. Yeah, again, I think it goes back to just, again, the problem of it not of the books not being finished because the whole issue is that it becomes very clear at a certain point within the books that like Martin was planning to move into more of like the fantasy realm element and not just with Bran, obviously Bran, the, 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 the very specific reason for me being why Bran is kind of like the first character that we see in these books is the fact that like, as time goes on, we start to see that like there are some sorcerer stuff happening with other things. Like cause Bran, even though he's the only war in the books, and it is revealed that both Arya and Jon throughout the course of the books also have warlike abilities. We have like some sorceress lurkings with Euron. Obviously, everything that's going on with the White Walkers and how that ties in with everything. You know, there's even some rumors, of course, of like of some certain things that happen in Daenerys's corner of the world and everything. Like the whole thing is that like Martin was very deliberate about how he brought in the sorcerer's elements. But I think the mistake that the show made is not transitioning into more of that and continuing to just like again just get into wrap-up phase and like they again just rushing through them you know when it became very clear that like the entire kind of crux and like transition from the second half act to the third act of this kind of grand overarching story was going to be much more sorceress in nature ultimately and it's kind of distressing because you're right at least at this point in the show 
these were some of my favorite points when Brian was starting to get into more of the magic, when we were starting to get like a little bit more of like, you know, okay, what, what me finding out what the hints of the, these visual cues were, you know, and, and ultimately you know, at the point where we thought that the show was not going to pull a loss and not just continue to lead us on and jerk our chain as far as all these things go. And it's crazy because in hindsight, like lost is one of those shows that, ultimately kind of did provide more answers in hindsight than this show did ultimately as far as kind of all of its mysteries that it had going on. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, again, the magic is we understand the past of brand, the builder, and he's the one that built the wall. And, uh, you know, obviously brand can go back and impact the past. So I think there is a, a big sense. This storyline goes into the territory of, you know, brand, the, the one that we, uh, have a little bit, you know, uh, fallen in love with from season one, you know, since he, uh, was pushed out the window and, and injured permanently. And he's been, you know, basically working his way up to relevancy again. Uh, it, like we're there through his whole journey. We get to see all the trials and tribulations he goes through and the whole idea of him being able to impact the past. And maybe he's the one that kind of inspired brand, the builder to, to build the wall. And like, how does that tie in? Like what's, what extent of the connection is that he was the three eyed Raven and you know, his ancestor was very popular. Like uh, all that stuff is really uh, cool to, to focus your mind on. Um, and you know, it's, it's, we really never get to see it pay off. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. couple more storylines that I just want to hit before we get into kind of some of the middle crux, right? So we stopped north of the wall. Obviously, we got a couple, two quick scenes. So I was I was a little bit wrong in my estimation last last week. Last week, I said the Mance Raider was in four episodes. He's famously actually in five because I forgot that he appeared in this episode. I only I thought that Mance was only in last week's episode and then next week's episode when he sends John and Tormund on the mission uh, south. Obviously, in order to climb over the wall and then attack. Oh, yeah. the nice He's only salt down. and peppered in there, you know. He is salt very, and peppered very, in there. Very but few it, appearances. But again, I find it very interesting how this is the next scene that we cut to after that opening brand sequence, right? Kind of, you know, connected together of the wargs, right? Where Mance is still interrogating John. He still doesn't quite trust him. He doesn't quite fit. Again, he's kind of welcomed them into the wildling side, but he also is like, uh, you know, oh, how could you know what it's like to lead all these people, you know? But, but again, just kind of calling out more of his naivete. He kind of clues John in into like how he brought all of the clans together and everything. And then uh, well, I think. Yeah, I think that's exactly uh, one of the most key parts about this scene is the fact is he says to John, like, how did I get all these clans to come together? And it's because I told them that they're all going to die if we don't get south. And that's the truth. Yeah. And then he sort of walks off. And the whole idea is that Mance teaches John in this moment that telling the truth uh, being adamant about it and being right about it. Uh, that is what it means to lead people. And I think that's a very interesting uh, story development is like the whole idea is Jon Snow is learning from, you know, Mormont. He's learning from Mance. He's learning from all these people how to be a, a better, more effective leader. And that's going to set him up for the later seasons uh, when he's actually in charge of, you know, hopefully saving the kingdoms. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's an important, it's a small scene, but it's an important scene. Right. And I think it, it's interesting how it's kind of juxtaposed, right. With the next scene where we catch up with the night's watch. Obviously first he sees RL we're introduced. Obviously here, um, you know, Mackenzie Davis famously, uh, the, the, um, the Dwight stand in from the original British character, British version of the office, as well as, you know, one of the two, like, you know, comedic sidekick duos in uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Uh, we're introduced to him here as RL, the resident, uh, wildlings white, uh, sorry, not white. Um, what's it called? Um, war. A lot of W's north of the wall, who obviously the ability of the warg is that obviously they can shift their mind into the into the minds of other animals. He's kind of using this crow to spy on them, and he kind of lets them know. He's like, okay, I just saw the fist of the first man. He sees the after effects of the attack there. And then obviously we cut to the rest of the Night's Watch as they're marching south, right? Where, oh, again, yeah. just, where, where Sam know, just basically scene. gives or, up on life. Sam just gives up. Sam just gives up. And it's a really, it's really interesting. It's a quick, but it's a funny scene. He just gives up. It's like Rass is, you know, throwing him. It's like all those people died and you live. You know, how do you feel about that? And he kind of just gives up. The Lord Commander comes over and is like, I forbid you to die. And then he kind of entrusts him to Rast, which may be a mistake. It's like, yeah, if Rast, if, if he dies on your watch, then you die too. You know, like, I, I don't know. Like this, It's definitely like, uh, this is a season where all the seeds are kind of, you know, planted as far as like certain oh, characters dying. Once, but. once once again, it's another good leadership scene. And, and I feel like uh, that's, that's one of the things that this show does really well is like it sets up 
you know, these mentors for the next generation, you know, basically Jon Snow uh, and, you know, his buddies, basically Sam and also the other members of the Night Watch that end up uh, having his back. It, it basically, there's a lot of teachable moments that show the, you know, previous generation really pushing that information down to the next generation. Uh, and I think, you know, any of those scenes that show up in this series uh, are really uh, well handled. Yeah, but they, again, the only difference, I guess, being here is that, again, it's one of those moments where Mormont, even though he has good intentions, it ultimately ends up biting him back in the ass because, again, it's, he's, he's dealing with a, man, well, a matter of... Yeah, yeah. Mormont's time is, uh, you know... It's very, definitely very, coming. Very, very limited uh, very, very, uh, very short. in this very, story. Very, very short, ultimately. Yeah, it's a matter of, like, again, he trusts in his man a little bit too much is all that I'm going to say there. But the only other brief moment that we have to cover as far as that goes is the North. Oh, boy. We were waiting. We got to it, but we got to cover it. Your boy, Theon, we're back with him. Again, there was a gap in between uh, at the end when, you know, he was last making the speech to end all speeches, and he gets knocked out by his right-hand guy, Dagmar Cleft, a little bonk on the head, and he wakes up, strapped to a freaking, like, again, it, it's it's very clever how it does it, where you don't really know what it is. It looks like there's, a, like, kind of this X right, right in the middle, but it's interesting how when you see the wide shot later on, you can just barely see the outlines of the flayed man of Bolton on there, but Theon wakes up in this location. He doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know who's taking him captive. Right, The last thing he remembers is his right-hand man balking him on the head, and he's just being tortured randomly by these soldiers, you know? They're asking, a few of them, they're asking him questions about like, uh, you know, kind of why he took over Winterfell and everything, but the torture doesn't seem to be going anywhere, and I guess that's what throws him off and what throws the other people off, is because usually, when you see torture sequences in movies and TV, right? They're gruesome, but they're usually there for a reason, because they're usually there to, like, extract information out of someone in order to push the plot forward this is where we get into one of those moments where it's not necessarily there as a story development it's kind of only there both to occupy time to make this character kind of it's it's one of the rare instances where you see the character almost suffering for you know the 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 consequences of their actions you know but not in the way that you thought I, i think it's a characterization of the boltons right that they effectively uh, like the torture for the sake of torturing. And it doesn't matter what they're torturing Theon for at the start of it. Uh, they're just enjoying it. They're having a grand old time shoving metal things down his uh, fingernails, etc. So, uh, you know, I think it's one of those things where, yeah, Theon, uh, from the audience point of view, we get to see him sort of, uh, you know, deal with his the consequences of his actions. But ultimately, it slowly introduces us to the Boltons and how gruesome they can actually be. Yeah, the Boltons in this in this kind of the Bolt- we obviously met Bruce Bolton last season, but the Boltons are really introduced as far as full on display, both as far as what they're capable of and kind of their deviousness and kind of how they've come around and don't kind of share the same ideals as like the rest of the Northerners, you know. And like obviously we see how that comes back to bite them later on. But I find it really interesting, right? How again it's that slow, subtle build up to it where you have um, what's called. You have also the introduction of Ramsay, who will event, who will ine- who will eventually kind of take over Joffrey's role as kind of the new, like kind of sadistic, you know, you love to hate character that's in the show. And we're introducing him here, obviously, but we have no idea who he is, right? Because when we meet him, he's posing as this servant boy, right? And he comes up to Theon, pretending to be, you know, the pretending to be, um, you know, you know, the uh, what's it called pretending to have been sent by Yara, his sister. And we kind of we kind of just have that to go base off of, you know, it's, it's a really kind of, I think, interesting and fascinating character introduction. And I think that does a really like kind of different kind of, you know, like introduction as far as like a bad guy. Like we were introduced to the Lannisters, right, a couple of seasons ago. And the whole thing about the Lannisters is that they're, we're introduced to them regally kind of like as, you know, the, like the, the sinister kind of behind the scenes, really the ones that are pulling the strings. But then we obviously discover that like that's kind of all that they were good at. And once they're kind of put on centerfold and display they don't necessarily handle well and they kind of have to rely on the more like intimidating members of their family but this instance shows that like no every member of the boltons is all about the deviousness all about kind of like you know getting what they want through torture and through like yeah, just the well, worst the worst they the boltons like to do things behind the scenes they're very uh you know uh basically like to be uh scandalous and, and doing schemes and uh, torturing people, but not just torturing people physically, uh, but impacting them mentally. You know, it, it's basically if you psych out your opponent, they're not going to be at top form. And I think that's one of the things that the Boltons really and truly believe in is that if we can psych them out 
and also do bodily harm to them, uh, they're not going to perform at top, uh, you know, uh, performance. And therefore we can actually one up them and take over or do whatever we got to do and take advantage. And I feel like that sort of, you know, slowly gets introduced here. Uh, and throughout the course of the Bolton storyline, uh, that is, you know, tried and true, that is what they're doing uh, from start to finish. So I, I think it's uh, really just uh, clever how they develop, uh, you know, this family and, and this sort of like very meticulous, very, uh, you know, mind game style uh, of messing around with their, uh, you know, opposition. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, it makes sense because like we're so I, I think also the thing that goes into that conversation as well is kind of, you know, how they end up meeting their demise at the end, which is the fact that like we're obviously the thing that kind of is established this season is I think a big difference between obviously both Roos Bolton and even though we he was talked about last season, this is the first time that we see Ramsey Bolton in kind of, you know, in action and like as a character. And we see kind of like their differing methods, right? Where Roos, the thing about Roos is Roos obviously, you know, does the torture as far as like, you know, because that's kind of like the family tradition, right? The, the sigil of the Boltons is literally the flayed man. But Roos is a guy who you can tell has like kind of learned to keep his appetites at bay, where he only brings out the devious and the ruthless side when he needs to, as far as that goes. But Roos is all about getting what he can to further and propel his family forward and Ramsey is the total opposite of that as established because once we learn that this is kind of old as like kind of like a mi mental mind game of Ramsey's in order to keep the on down not only, not only keep him down but kind of like destroy any sense of like pride and any sense of self that he has you can tell that Ramsey is a guy who delights in the torture who delights in the destruction right in a way that not even Joffrey was capable of as far as that goes and it's ultimately that divide between those two utterly polar opposite aspects of the Boltons that ultimately brings about their end you know, as, as far as that goes, ultimately results in Ramsey taking the initiative, killing his father, and then leading the Boltons ultimately to ruin at the end of season six, ultimately. So it's a really fascinating introduction to a family that, again, at least at the time before, you know, all the deuce ex machinas that were introduced in the later season stood to gain like a pretty, a pretty firm hold as far as once they gain, regain control of the North and everything. But, um, we then move to kind of the second act of the episode in, in the Riverlands. We have three storylines that happen in the Riverlands primarily. We're back to Harren Hall. We're back to Rob. Rob doesn't get to spend much time in Harren Hall and enjoy like seemingly the one victory that he's had since the Battle of Whispering Wood at the end of season one, where he's in Harren Hall. He's schmoozing with Talisa once again. And oh, oh man, they, they're... They are really just dumping it on us at this point, right? Like, it's funny because, like I said, obviously nobody knew at the time that the Red Wedding was coming. But in hindsight, man, these seeds are almost like it's, it's almost like they have both have signs taped to their head that says I'm dead by the end of this season. As far as like, whatever <laughs> he shows us in Talisa. You know, Dom, it, it's in, in terms of these scenes, it, it basically they are kind of floundering. Um, and really, you know, it's, it's just like, you know. Uh, basically, I think it's when Rob gets those, uh, the Ravens, uh, you know, and, and just before he gets those, he's kind of just like talking about, um, you know, have we really lost? You know, it's, yeah. it's, they, they don't really know what they're doing in this yeah. war. Yeah. It's, it's like, they've won some... it's, they're literally, they're literally spinning in circles. That's what they're doing here. Exactly. And, and, and it goes like before, the decision was, do we cross back over the river and go back to the north? And, you know, I think Rob basically, you know, rejected that. And it's it's always an option for them to retreat and just hold the north. Uh, but for whatever reason, they're committed. And I, I think they're just uh, swimming in a pond that's a little too big for uh, what type of fish they are. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of re further emphasized, obviously, when Bruce Bolton brings in the letters. Oh, oh man, you, you know that things are bad when you get two letters that both contain bad news. I love that, like, Rob is like, uh, Bruce is like, I have two letters. And Rob's like, which one is the good news? And Bruce almost like looks both aside. He's like, man, I can't even keep a straight face for this. Like, that, none of these contain good news as far as that goes. They obviously learn. First and foremost, obviously, of everything that has finally transpired with Winterfell, that that the, that the castle has been put to the torch, that Bran and Rickon are nobody are nowhere to be found. He tells Catelyn, "Rob's trying to remain optimistic, but Catelyn is already of the opinion, like man, like my 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 children are dead. Like it was like Rob is the only Rob is the only one that I have left. You know, Sansa is still captive in Winterfell. No one knows where Arya is. Bran and Rickon, who the hell know who the hell knows now? She." Catelyn is not having a good time as far as that goes and it really sucks like I said because I think that of all the characters that have the most tragic build up to the, to the kind of their demise and fate I really think that Catelyn is one of them because she is a person who again after a certain point all she wanted you know was to go home to Winterfell to be with her children but she ended up kind of getting stuck with Rob a little bit longer than she wanted to then the whole Ironborn invasion happened yeah. well, then she let Jamie go 
The, one of the main things I, I was watching the episode earlier, just to make sure I, I could speak about it tonight and, you know, just to see if I miss anything or anything like that. But, uh, I actually, you know, I don't normally watch the, uh, you know, behind the scenes featurette that they, they have at the very end of the episodes, uh, on HBO. And today I, I started watching it. I didn't get through the whole thing, but one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, the, the directors basically brought up was, um, the fact that, uh, Catelyn Stark, probably started this war by arresting Tyrion and putting him on trial. And, probably. And that, that's really what escalated it into a full-blown war. And, you know, here it is, you're getting that news, you know, that Winterfell was sacked and, and right. uh, some bad stuff happened. Uh, so so Catelyn's in that state of mind where uh, she realizes that she escalated this, um, you know, at least maybe she feels a little bit guilty about it. And the fact is, um, you know, this has led to the destruction of her family. And, you know, it, she really only has a little bit left. Um, you know, whereas before, obviously, it was this kind of uh, very thriving family. So uh, I think, you know, to, to what you're saying, where Catelyn's at, really at this like heavy guilt stage, I, I think even the creators of the show are, are basically uh, th in that same mindset. It, it's basically like she, uh, you know, decided to push for the war against the Lannisters. And, um, you know, that's kind of led them to where they are now. Yeah, and it kind of reflects also, it, it, it kind of harkens back to me to like kind of some of her words of Ned, like urging him not to go south to King's Landing in the first episode of... Um, and of the of the show and ultimately how she definitely sounds not super but like definitely more antagonistic towards the Lannisters than Ned does and I think that obviously comes down to like kind of you know where she grew up she grew up in River in River Run like which is only like a couple hundred miles from uh from Casterly Rock and the control of the Lannisters as opposed to the North which is like over hundreds of thousands of miles away and so isolated from everything else you know so she's got a little bit more experience there but ultimately it just shows that like ultimately her actions have completely led to almost the complete decline of her family as far as that goes and like she even kind of it's kind of revealed more so when she had that conversation with Talisa later on over you know when she's sewing the thing when she tells her the story of like Jon Snow and how she ultimately she, she realized that she was making the mistake as far as like cursing this child for something that was not his fault his existence which was not his fault and when when Jon got really sick as a baby she prayed to the gods to, that he would get better and he did but also she didn't keep part of that promise where she would accept him as one of her own she was she would uh, you know, beg Ned to give him the name Stark to remove the bastard heritage, and she never did. And she, how she kind of blames herself for that, as far as that goes. It was, it was a, it was a brief moment, but it was a really interesting moment. Uh, you know, that kind of gains introspective, kind of adds more to the, like that kind of residual guilt that she's feeling. And as far as just kind of like the overall feelings of, you know, kind of like not feeling very, you know, not at all feeling. Um, oh my God, what's the word that I'm looking for? Of uh, fe feeling uh, confident towards Rob's mission is uh, Lord Karstark. Oh, man, he is just rubbing it in because they're marching south. He even says it. He's like, you know, this funeral is a distraction. And Rob kind of says, it's like, oh, you, you, got, you got something to say here? And he doesn't say it in so many words, but but, but he definitely says it. He's like, I, I think you've lost this war, and I think that you've made a mistake by marrying Talisa and all that. Again, just kind of more so just pointed out the obvious, like kind of just sticking the knife in, we know, as far as that goes. But, yeah, it's, it's the things that ultimately things are not looking good in Rob's corner of the world, as we can say. But... Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I, and I think, you know, uh, to kind of continue on in terms of uh, what's going on in the Riverlands, like yes. uh, we have two characters that we uh, love that are just love. wandering around in the woods, yep. um, you know, or the fields or the farms or, or wherever. wherever. It's it's Brienne and Jamie who are stumbling around uh, trying to head south to King's Landing uh, so that this deal that Catelyn set up can actually uh, maybe take place. Yeah, a deal, I, I, I think, is giving a little bit too much credit. The more so, it was, I, I would say it was a half-assed attempt to kind of, you know, b barter and, and make sure that she could get her girls back. But honestly, like, outside of Brienne, I don't know how legitimate this is because the problem is Littlefinger brought her the terms while she was in Renly Baratheon's camp. And so much has happened since then that honestly, like... Uh, again, this is the instances where, again, in the short term, Catelyn really did have no other choice as far as letting Jamie go, as far as doing whatever she could in order to get the girls back. But long term, this is, this is just going to bite her in the ass ultimately because, again, she's let her only protection go as far as Brienne. And in a weird way, she did end up saving Brienne's life because then Brienne's not with her, obviously, at the Red Wedding and, and inevitably probably doesn't die at the Red Wedding. 
But uh, Brienne and Jamie are obviously trekking further and further south. They end up getting spotted by a farmer. Jamie thinks that the farmer recognizes him just by the way that he, uh, you know, so casually moves on. But Brienne states that, you know, he's an innocent. I'm not going to kill him just because you have one thought. And I, again, there's a reason why these two are like the centerpiece and like the MVP of the season, because just they're back and forth, the training barbs. The thing that's so interesting about the relationship that's kind of established here is the fact that even though Jamie is taunting her, right? He's also, he's not doing it out of a sense of, he's obviously doing it from a sense of boastfulness in the sense of like, okay, like he definitely, he definitely is trying to get into her head so that he can kind of like break her down mentally. Like he knows how to do right. that. Well, well, he's still thinking of escape, you know, which I think is uh, sort of the centerpiece of, of their storyline in this episode. Like uh, for the most part, like when they stop to do a bathroom break, um, you know, it, basically Brian's watching him, you know, um, the whole time. And, 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 you know, he basically uh, casually like, you know, turns towards her and, uh, make sure that, you know, she could bear witness to everything because, uh, you know, he's not shy about it. You know, I think that's one of the things is like, it's, uh, not hiding anything. The two of them are sort of, um, you know, uh, very blunt, very direct towards each other. And it, there's nothing that they're going to hide, you know, not even like they're, um, disdain for each other it, just because they're on the, the opposite sides. And, you know, ultimately, uh, at the end of this storyline, they, they get to the bridge, Jamie sort of just plops down and, you know, uh, sets himself up for an escape attempt and they end up in a sword fight, which, uh, you know, Brienne puts an Wait. end to it. Wins. Yeah. It's, it, again, it, it's it's one of my favorite moments, not only of this episode, but of quite, quite possibly of the entire show, because the thing that happens that, that this scene tells you a couple different things as far as, like again, more so like the action telling you things about the characters, which is that Jamie could so easily in that attempt have run for it. And, and it would have been a, it would have been it would have taken a decent amount of time because like Brian's got armor on, you know, she's kind of a little bit weighed more more so weighed down by that. He could have easily run. But no, he stays and he fights because he's got to show her a thing or two because he's got to show off because that's his thing. But it's in the sense it's where like kind of again, these relationship between these two is established because again, like one of the reasons why they kind of hate each other at first is because they are very similar. They are both blunt instruments. They are both kind of, you know, gruff. No nonsense. You know, Jamie obviously is a smooth talker and knows how to get his way when he needs to. But he also, again, when the shit, when the shit is down, he is a man of action first and foremost. But she is, too. That's the whole thing is that her entire upbringing, her entire life has been about, you know, proving wrong the people who don't think anything of her. And she sees Jamie as just another instance in that. So when their fight happens, it's almost like not only does she kind of like gain his mutual respect, because the thing that I love about reading this chapter and how it translated into the books is that in this chapter, we're in Jamie's head and just following his entire monologue throughout this fight as it goes on. And the whole thing about it that happens is at first he's like, OK, I can easily take this person. And it goes, oh, man, I'm getting tired. I'm not as good as I used to to holy shit this bro this woman's actually a really good fighter and like actually kind of like my match you know because again he's not keeping in mind the fact that he's literally been sitting in a in, in a fucking muddy cage for an entire season or so but like it, it's a really interesting scene it's a really interesting sequence as far as that goes and I think it, it it does the most as far as like kind of expressing kind of the relationship that these are two are going to have throughout the course of the rest of the show but unfortunately, it ends with, oh, man, these Boltons, they just cannot escape from yeah. these Boltons. You know? well, Boltons well, the are proving to be in trouble for both sides, like the Starks, the Greyjoys, yeah. the Lannisters. Nobody gets along with the Boltons. What, what I love about this scene is they, they kind of come across the two of them fighting. Obviously, Brienne has sort of put Jamie uh, in his place, so to speak. And they try to play the same game where it's like, hey, you know, we're just two travelers traveling south. Don't worry about us. Just let us go on our way. And the response is, well, you know, uh, my employers would not really be happy if I uh, knowingly let the Kingslayer go. <laughs> you know, so like 100 percent, they identify who it is and they make it clear that you're now our prisoners and there's no escape from this. And, and also just um, the, again, that, that freaking tournament of Willem Frey, they bring out the farmer, obviously who Jamie knew again, it sucks because Jamie was right in this. It's Jamie knew he said, that guy knows me. He's going to wrap me out. And he did because that freaking tournament, it was the same thing that his cousin said to him, his cousin that he killed last season. And it was the same thing this season that got hit where the guy brings it out. I recognize him for the tournament of Sir Willem Frey. And he's just like that goddamn fucking tournament. It is going to, get me every yeah. single time. Hey, listen, I, I think it's one of those things where um, them getting caught, 
is like, you know, it, it's a good cliffhanger. Yes. Um, because what happens uh, next in the storyline is amazing. And uh, we'll save that for another time. It's amazing. Um, this, this is this yeah. is my ultimate favorite storyline of the episode. But then obviously we cut to the last storyline of the Riverlands, which is Arya. We cut back in. We didn't check in with her at all last episode. Again, it's I, I love how the start of the scene is literally just Gendry chastising her for everything that she did last season. Like her entire storyline last season, Gendry is like, wait, you had a faceless man in your employ? And you didn't end the war when you could have like that. That just that whole dialogue issue just had me chuckling like right. Yeah, there. It, it, it's it's really uh, I think it's pretty cool. It, it's on the nose. It kind of explains some of the, the you know issues that we had watching uh, the last season. Uh, I think this scene is really good because it introduces the the brotherhood uh, without banners uh, and it gives them a lot of uh, personality. Obviously, we have the priest who is sort of identifies. Soros. And the main, Soros yeah, is here. He, He's the main talker of the group. Uh, we introduced the archer who sort of, and guy. Uh, di- he disappears at some point. Yeah, I, I he guess, just disappears. Does it, does he get an on-screen death or something? Or, no, off-screen I, death. I'm assuming so. Cause the whole thing, right. Is this is the last time we see the brotherhood, right? We're introduced to the brotherhood where they they seem like such this awesome band. This like, you know, this really bunch of cool, interesting characters. And then both in the books and the show, once Arya gets scooped up by the how we never see these guys again, at least until season six, where they kind of just show up again in the fright. It's like, Oh, so they've just still been hanging around this whole time. And then before they're like, kind of, you know, planning on heading north again you know we see barrack and thoros again but we never see the archer again and i'm like oh man he must have he must have had an untimely off-screen death because of the way that we're introduced this guy this guy is awesome and you think that he's gonna be like yeah, another one of the, the permanent members you know the whole thing it was, it was, he shoots an arrow up into the sky and tells hot pie hey you better pay attention to me because i just shot that arrow in the sky and by the time i'm done talking it's gonna land exactly where you're standing and you better move because I just finished what I need to say. I, I, also and then, love, <laughs> I, I love the line afterwards where like they're trying to help Hot Pie out of the thing, and he's just like, "Of all all the people starving in the and, and, all the people starving in the world, and, and, he, and look at how fat he is." And he and then what was it? Thoro says something along the lines of like, "Maybe it's because of fat boys like him that the world is starving or something like that." Which again, I'm just gonna say, can people in fiction stop picking on overweight people? Certain overweight people cannot help their weight. Just because they're overweight does not mean that they are the result of all of the world's problems and flaws. Well, you know, listen, it's the Middle Ages and these people are uh, basically, you know, crass. They're just going to throw out their thoughts and not worry about it. You know, it's not they're not worried about being insensitive right. you know, in, in this type of world Clearly. Uh, where everyone is just murdering each other. Yeah. Uh, okay, so casual murder is a thing in this universe. Like they, they, they're, they're the kind of their moral quandary about sensitivity and feelings kind of goes out the window. But like, I well, love uh, it goes back. To, it goes back to the hound. Right. You know, yeah. in, in uh, him telling Sansa, like, you know, you're looking at a murderer. Your father was a murderer. We're all murderers. You know, murderers have control, you know, etc. cetera. Uh, so, the hound's outlook on this world, uh, you know, really makes it a, a glum place. It's ironic, obviously, too, because this is obviously the episode that brings back the hound after two episodes off screen. He was another character. Again, we weren't quite sure of his fate after the Battle of Blackwater, but we meet him again in this episode. But I also can we talk about the Brotherhood for a second, because I, I love the introduction in this episode. I I, I kind of like the fact that like so their whole origin is the fact that, again, way back in season one, again, it was a blinker. You'll miss it moment. But it was in the scene where Ned Stark was sending out was sent them all out originally in order to bring out justice to Gregor Clegane. Obviously, when Tywin sent him out in order to attack the Riverlands as revenge, ironically enough, also. Speaking of, Catelyn unintentionally started the war by capturing Tyrion because of Cat's capture of Tyrion. And then ultimately when Ned died and it switched to now the Lannisters being in charge, we got they, they're kind of like the after effects of like, you know, from the Ned Stark era as far as that goes. Because they kind of started out with this one mission and then as a result they ended up kind of becoming criminals because of the, the changing of power. And now they kind of just like... They, they've kind of given up on like serving the Starks and, you know, kind of executing Ned Stark's original vision. And now they kind of just carry out... Um, what's it called? Now they just carry out who, uh, what's it called? Now they just carry out kind of like whatever kind of justice they can towards the common, towards, uh, you know, for the commoners. And I just wanted to answer Jay's question here, which is that, is it true that in the books it was the, it was the brotherhood without banners, not the band of brothers that came upon Catelyn's body after the Red Wedding? And the answer to that is yes, obviously. That's what actually results in the Lady Stoneheart uh, storyline that was famously dropped from the books. But we'll get to that, obviously, once we get to some of the later seasons, ultimately, and how that storyline was ultimately dropped. But yeah, because we're introduced, even though we're not introduced to Beric Dondarrion, obviously, in his famous recast, and we are introduced to Thoros of Mir here, who is the first red priest that we've met outside of um outside of Melisandre because Melisandre was kind of like our introduction into the world of red of the red priest and she was kind of like presented this this one 
kind of instance and variation of this religion. But we also see Thoros, who apparently has been a figure in King's Landing for this entire time. Like, he, again, the whole thing is he talked about how he was friends with Robert Baratheon. And the whole thing is that even though he was a member of the Red Priesthood, he never really believed in his ability. And he kind of like always just kind of took himself as just like, you know, just another soldier up until the point that he discovered his powers. And like, we'll get into that later on in the episode. But I find it interesting kind of like for the most part, these are like, kind of the only like normal people that Ari has met so far since leaving King's Landing. Like, you know, they're a little bit dastardly. They're a little bit of scoundrels. You know, they, they like to have fun. They like to delight, but they also, again, they do genuinely believe in what they're fighting for. Cause they're fighting for ultimately the one centerpiece of people who nobody in this world seems to care for, which are the common people, the people yeah. who are getting squeezed between the sides in the war, in the wars between the high Lords. I think they're very charismatic too, because, you know, obviously they go to an inn, uh, and they're feeding their their uh, captors, and they're basically saying, "Hey, we're we're gonna let you go. You know, just finish your food, etc." And Arya decides to take up needle and uh, you know, f uh, or whatever sword she has at the time, and, and yeah. fight with with the main dude. And you know, he gets up and he's been drinking, and he just like knocks the sword knocks out of like her hand. And then there's a little spin yeah. around too for dramatic effect. Yeah, and grabs a beer and he says to your brothers because you know she was telling him how uh, she learned to fight from her brothers and right. <laughs> basically he's mocking her yeah. and that's when um, some of the other Angai, brothers come Angai, in and the Angai the Archer. Can we just talk about what a great name that is to Angai the Archer? Like, oh man, I, that's a name that should be brought back for modern time because I know everyone was bringing because remember when the, when the show had that brief popularity moment where all those moms were naming their kids like Daenerys and Tyrion and all those Game of Thrones. Like, I think there was somebody who even named their daughter like Khaleesi even though that wasn't even the freaking name. That and that's a name that should be brought back as Angai. Like, like it just rolls off the tongue too, like Angai the Archer, and they bring in and they bring in a abnormally large prisoner, as Thoros says, and he's like, "How did somebody get such an abnormally large person?" And he's like, "Wait until they snuck back a couple, and then went to sleep." And he pulls off the hood, and is revealed to be the Hound. He has not been having so much luck since he left yeah. King's Landing. And, and I, I think this is uh, one of the most beautifully shot scenes because you know Arya tries to get Hot Pie and Gendry to yeah, leave. Yeah, she's trying to move. She's trying and, to get out of there. Yeah, and then it, the you know the Hound notices her, and then it cuts to sort of an over the shoulder of uh, what what is it? Uh, Theros, I guess. Thoros. Uh, T h o r o s. Thoros. Thoros. Yeah. yeah. So Thoros and the Hound, and he's basically asking you like, you know, what are you doing with the Stark bee? You know. Yeah. Like, what, uh, what, what not, are you doing? Not with to say. Obviously, yeah. Not to say that expletive but right. uh, basically uh it's a really well shot you know well done shot because you know she's framed right in the center of the frame sort of like she's caught and the two of them are in the foreground you know having this conversation um you know so i, I really liked how the scene plays out uh, i think it's really well shot and ultimately it reveals Arya for who she is uh, and leaves us on another cliffhanger. It's like, okay, now that the, the brotherhood knows that this is a Stark, uh, what are they going what to are do? They gonna do? And then, yeah. you know, that's the end of the storyline. Right. Yeah. So lot, we're going to find out tomorrow, you know, yeah, I guess yeah. our and next the, week, so to speak. Our next week. Yeah. A lot, a lot of interesting cliffhangers, a lot of interesting stuff that kind of ends up getting wrapped up and kind of ponders the question. Like I said, this really is, it's catching us up on all the stuff that we missed last episode, but also again, it's really getting us shaped up as far as like kind of what we're to expect going forward. And that brings us to the last of our storylines in this episode. And also let's talk about, Oh man, Pat, I've been waiting to talk about this focus character segment. I've been waiting this entire time because in King's Landing, this episode, right? So like I said, King's Landing definitely takes a backseat as far as the central action goes. But like I said, as we get more and more so into the political games that are being played between the Lannisters and the Tyrells, we meet the Queen of Thorns herself, Lady Olena Tyrell, the matriarch of the Tyrell family and revealed to be the true brains and intelligence behind them, portrayed by the late, great Diana Rigg. This was one of the last performances that she gave. Obviously, again, she she was on this season. She was on this show for five seasons from the, from her first appearance in this episode until her last appearance in season seven, four years ago in 2017. She unfortunately was one of the casualties that we lost during the pandemic. She died. Um, and around September of 2020, if I'm remembering correctly, but, she, but not before she did complete filming for Edgar Wright's newest upcoming film, Last Night in Soho, for which she has an appearance in. But obviously, we you know we have a couple of events that lead into this, right? Again, the, the stuff about the King's Landing stuff this season is really interesting because, again, it leads. It seems like it's going nowhere, 
but it, it seems like there's not a lot happening action wise. But again, all the kind of the political ploys that are um, that are happening between the Lannisters and the Tyrells here are very interesting. Where it starts off right with Joffrey and Cersei, and Cersei's kind of trying to pick Joffrey's brain, trying to plant ideas in there. They're like, okay, can we really trust Marjorie? And Joffrey right now is kind of only focused on the tactical advantage because once again, Joffrey is still kind of you know he's king. Everything is you know everything. Well, is I, I, him. I think Joffrey's only focused on the type of crossbows he can actually. Yeah, have. but with Joffrey, jo- Joffrey is like <laughs> not know? all concerned with anything right now. He's well, like, is, we isn't that the main scene well. that he's in? Like he's he's like, oh, you just have to crank this and then <laughs> aim and Again, it's this, you know. I, I don't know how intentional the writing there was, especially since he had Marjorie in the scene. But like, I will, we'll get to well, that yeah. scene because that's well, one of my that, favorite that, scenes. That, like, that scene happens after the whole uh, lemon tart scene, right? So, yes. uh, you know what? You know they they basically interrogate Sansa, get some information, and then Marjorie immediately acts upon it. Yeah. Um, well, 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 so first things first, obviously. So we have obviously Cersei trying to play these ideas in Joffrey's head. Joffrey just doesn't care at all. Then we obviously have the thing with Sansa and Shay, kind of the setup scene where Shay is trying to like interrogate Sansa, trying to figure out like what Littlefinger wants, but she doesn't have a clue. She just thinks that Littlefinger again. Sansa, that, that's the thing that I still like about the season two is that Sansa they still establish that even after everything she's gone through, she still has this harsh naivete about people. She still doesn't quite understand that everyone is kind of in it for their yeah. own game. But well, she's not. She's not playing the game right, right now. She's still not and, playing the game ultimately. Hey. Listen, like, you know, it goes to my theory that if you're not playing the game, you're basically on the chopping block. Well, and the I fact think is, I... uh, Sans is too valuable. Uh, to, to actually be executed or, at or this taken point, it's out. The, it's the only thing that's keeping her alive at this point is the exactly. fact that she is so valuable, is uh, the fact that she is the key to reclaiming the North. But again, it, it's what leads us ironically the, enough the, to... Yeah, but the later the seasons, that, that, uh, yeah. you know, Sansa basically uh, turns it around and starts playing the game. Yeah, is, again, one of my yeah. favorite character turnarounds is on the show, but it leads to, again, one of my favorite character introductions ever, where Loras comes in again, quite literally the knight in white shining armor, brings her and introduces her to Lady Olena. Oh man, Pat, like, they, I, I just gotta say, one of my favorite characters, one of my favorite introductions, one of my favorite performances on the entire show. Like, the thing about that's so awesome about Lady Olena is that she's one of the only people of her age that we see in the show that's not kind of like there by accident. Like, you can tell like, she has got a whole lot of us. She's one of the only people on the show. I think she's older than Tywin Lannister, if I'm remembering correctly, as far as the age-wise, or like they're right around the same age. And like, you know, as well as I do that, like you've got to be damn smart and got some, and got to have some skills on your side and some incredible luck in order to survive and make it to, to that age within the world of Westeros. Because if there's one thing yeah. this show is, well, I, that I think it's the way that, that naturally. Yeah. I think it's the way the family basically handles their business. Like they're very much like trying to, um, you know, slip in there and make you feel comfortable and really get on your side and then do what they got to do behind the scenes with kindness, if you will. Yeah, exactly. And and in this case, like, you know, the whole point of having Loris, you know, go to Sansa, that's no mistake. Uh, they understand that Sansa has a crush on Loris, uh, you know, and, and even though whatever Loris and, and Renly are, were together and everybody knows like Sansa is still that naive girl that basically is like, Oh, he's, he's the most beautiful knight, you know, etc. And Sansa is sort of, you know, has a crush on him and they use that to their advantage, even though it's never really explored as a major plot point. Uh, it's clear that they send him there for a reason. Yeah. Uh, and that puts her, you know, in a comfort zone. And then she goes into the meeting where the, Lemon tarts put her further into the comfort zone. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's very deliberately placed as far as like kind of how Marjorie, you know, Loris and trading her off to Marjorie and Marjorie's saying, oh, we're going to be such best, you know, good buddies. You know, again, we're, you know, we're these royal daughters. And she brings her before Lady Olena and Lady Olena has her introductions where it's like, again, Lady Olena is a person who suffers no fools. She, again, she she understands that like she, she doesn't necessarily have the same sort of like loving thoughts towards her family just because they're her family. You know, she's an intelligent, fierce woman and she respects intelligent, fierce woman and she makes it very clear that like even if she doesn't necessarily respect Sansa, she unders she kind of gets Sansa to kind of play to their advantage in the Tyrell way, which is again welcoming them in, being very warm to them, assuring her that she's within allies, she's within friends, and Sansa she gets Sansa to spill her gut. She gets Sansa because her whole thing is they're trying to figure out who they're up against. I think that's so well established the fact that again the Tyrell there was a reason why they have been around for as long as the Landers, and they're trying to understand who they are in bed with and just who they have allied themselves with. You know, again Lady Olena, one of the I think one of the interesting things that happened is that Renly's ghost continues to hang around this entire episode where she tells, you know, she gives them her very brutal, blunt, honest thoughts 
about Loris and, and about her husband and uh, her late husband and about her son, obviously Loris and Marjorie's father, um, Mace Tyrell, and kind of how she advised Mace and Loris against backing Renly because there was no way that Renly had a claim to the throne just in general and everything. Like, again, you can really see, like, where the power here is as far as that goes. And it's really interesting as far as, like, how they're able to get Sansa to reveal what it is that they need to know about Joffrey because now they knew who they're, who they're up against. And now they know... What, and it sets in motion, obviously, the plan that eventually comes about as far as like them assassinating Joffrey and, or like partaking to assassinate Joffrey and then them kind of, you know, continuing to place their, you know, their well, bits you're and talking about, in motion. Um Lady Elena's plan and yeah. uh, what's his face, Little Fingers, Little Fingers, because yes. because Marjorie's caught off. Marjorie is caught off. One hundred percent sure. Uh, I, I think this scene is also like Sansa reveals like how traumatized she is to the audience because you know immediately when she feels uh, a little bit comfortable, she just unleashes Spills about how Spills how terrible. Her gut. Exactly. But then immediately she realizes, oh my God, I'm saying this out loud. Yeah. I got to stop. And, you know, reverts back to the, uh, you know, the line uh, that she is been, you know, uh, forced to, to say for, for, for so long. Um, you know, so basically, um, you know, it almost shows us the audience that Sansa might be beyond uh, saving, uh, yeah. even this, this early on in the, in the show. Um, you know, and, and, uh, really, that's the upward battle that she has to face. But uh, again, w like you say, now that the Tyrells have this information of who Joffrey is, Marjorie goes into his bedroom chamber and starts, uh, starts working with, him. Starts working yeah, him. Let, yeah. let, let's be candid here. She starts working him. And again, Marjorie exactly. shows that she is, that she is again, the one person that's even capable. She's able to get from Joffrey what Cersei is even unable to, which is that she's able to get Joffrey to do exactly what she wants. She knows exactly when to be truthful with him. She knows exactly when to like play to him. She knows exactly when to like kind of, you know, prop up his ego a little bit. She knows exactly how, she even yeah. knows how to appeal to his <laughs> malicious side. I'm like, yeah, yeah, see, yeah, it's, they were it, talking, I'm like, God damn, dude, do I need oh, to be worried? What is it? What is it? Like, uh, hey, can you take me hunting? I realize yeah. that yeah, women don't do that, even, but my father like, never oh. let me. Yeah, and she's even like, yeah. oh, when she's like, would you like to see me kill something, Your Grace? And he's like, yes, I think I would. And you're just like, God damn. Like, obviously, we know where it goes later on. But like, yeah, there there is a reason why Marjorie's able to kind of wrap Joffrey around her little finger. And I think it's really interesting kind of how even though she comes clean about Renly and everything, and even though Joffrey, again, it shows that like, Joffrey is still obviously has some reservations as far as like, you know, whether or not they can fully trust the Tyrells and kind of like he tries to bend Marjorie to his will the same way that Sansa did. But Marjorie, again, is a lot at this point is a lot smarter than Sansa and shows that like, yeah, she's able to kind of, you know, she obviously knew all the time about Renly's, uh, you know, tendencies and she knew full well about them. But again, she plays dumb. She plays the innocent and she's able to play it to her advantage as far as like, OK, Renly may have hoodwinked us with his charm, but he may not have been competent in that area. And again, it, it works for for all intents and purposes. Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, hey, Marjorie does wonders with Joffrey. Uh, it seems like it's going to be working. And uh, that's that's where we're sort of left off in this episode. You know, there's so much more that happens in the series. Um, but Marjorie is always able to adapt and always able to sort of uh, gain the upper hand in these situations. Yeah, absolutely. Again, it just showed that, th that this is an episode, again, like primarily of setup, but if we can take anything away from this episode, it's an episode of wargs, it's an episode of power plays, and it's an episode of, of man, the Boltons, they are a coming, ultimately. So, I, and it was funny, too, because I was looking over the death count for this episode, and again, I think this is what, like, two episodes back-to-back -back in a row where we don't get any, like, major deaths that happen on screen. Obviously, we get the letter of, of, of Hoster Tully, uh, you know, Catelyn's, Catelyn and Lysa's father, who passes, but we get that in a letter or that's an off-screen death so like man i gotta say like the amount of like deaths that we're not seeing happen like for the first one i guess that like that you know they, they had to like save their death count for like later on because oh man once we get to later on in this season the bodies really do start dropping as far as that goes but that was a review of episode and kind of a recap of episode two of season three dark wings dark words again continue to tune in on sundays every sunday for the foreseeable future in order to continue to tune in for our recaps of this iconic show as we get closer in this case to the red wedding and also yeah, to the final and more the more dark times for theon, more dark times for theon. oh they're <laughs> yeah. only just beginning they're uh, only man just i i here. just I, I don't know if i can do it i, I really it, i'm it's, telling it's, you Pat, i have faith don't worry i have faith it's hard to watch these uh, scenes with theon just uh becoming less and less of a man yeah, well, you'll, you'll, you'll do it. You'll, you'll do fine, ultimately. Pat, where can the good people find you? 
Hey, listen, I'm talking Thrones with uh, you, Dom, here on Talking TV, trying to help out uh, your podcast as much as possible. And uh, hey, I, I do have an Instagram. I, I, I will post on there someday at Patrick W. Huber if you want to, uh, you know, just subscribe there and uh, see what's coming down the pipeline when I decide to jump into the Instagram world. Absolutely. And of course, you can follow me at Movie Nerd Reviews on Facebook and Instagram. But more importantly, you can continue to help out our channel by clicking the subscribe button, clicking the bell next to it, clicking the like button. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Talking TV Podcast across all the social media platforms. We'll be back next week for episode three, Walk of Punishment, 12 seasons in a short film, and watch more fucking movies. We'll see you guys next time.